Travels and Traditions with Bert Wolf is a classic travel journal. A record of Bert's search for information about our world and how we fit into it. Bert travels to the source of each story, trying to find the connections between our history and what is happening today. What he discovers can improve our lives and our understanding of the world around us. And of course, there's always Bert's slightly irreverent sense of humor. Uh-oh. Oh. oh, my goodness. We're going to need a bigger can. In this program, we discover the history of deep sea sports fishing and why the Palm Beaches of Florida became the world epicenter of the sport. We learn why people like Ernest Hemingway and the Lone Ranger were attracted to the sport. The Lone Ranger! We visit with the family that invented the sport fishing boat and how those boats have changed over the years. And I sit in a fighting chair and argue with our producer. He was an old man who fished alone in a skiff in the Gulf Stream, and he had gone 84 days now without taking a fish. Those are the opening lines of The Old Man in the Sea, book by Ernest Hemingway. Hemingway was fascinated by the size, the speed, and the energy of the great fish that swam in the Gulf Stream that runs along the coast of Florida. The swordfish, the marlin, the sailfish, the mako, the great white. Hemingway was also fascinated by a Bahamian legend of a giant sea monster that swam along the Gulf Stream. But it was only available for viewing on nights of the full moon. Big game fishing was the perfect sport for Hemingway. However, catching the fish was one thing. Getting them on board his boat before they were eaten by the sharks was another. Many of Hemingway's greatest catches ended up as lunch for the sharks. For Hemingway, sharks were the enemy. He kept a machine gun on board and would fire it at the sharks. He was one of the first to put his boat into full reverse in order to get his catch out of the ocean as fast as possible. But Hemingway was just one of the many famous people who were interested in deep sea fishing. To the best of my knowledge, the Lone Ranger was not into sport fishing. And as far as I know, Sergeant Preston of the Yukon was also not into sport fishing. But the creator of both those characters, Zane Gray, was a devoted sports fisherman. Zane Gray was an American author, best known for his novels and short stories about the West. He was also a dentist, but I think we should deal with that in a different program. The earnings from his books and their adaptation to films gave Gray the money to spend his time pursuing his greatest interest, which was big game fishing. His son, Lauren, claimed that Zane spent an average of 300 days a year on fishing boats. A favorite location was the Palm Beaches of Florida. In the interest of full disclosure, I should point out that I am okay at fishing, but rather poor at catching. As a result, most of my nautical life has been spent on sailboats. I started out at the age of six with a seven-foot optimist, and except for a brief interlude on, or should I say in, the USS Philadelphia, a fast-attack nuclear sub, I continued with sailboats. Over the years, I've become friendly with a number of people who are devoted to fishing, and those that were devoted to deep-sea sports fishing gave me a real appreciation for that sport, and particularly the boats that are designed for that sport. For most of the authorities on the subject, including my trusted Wikipedia, the people primarily responsible for the great advances in sport fishing boat design were members of the Rybovich family. I had heard about them, but never met them. 
but what I heard sounded interesting, and the more I heard about them, the more I began to think about the family I grew up in. Here was an opportunity to learn about deep sea sports fishing, to discover the techniques that were used to make these incredible boats, and to spend time with a family that made the family I grew up with look considerably less dysfunctional. Unbeatable. So here I am in the ocean, off the coast of the Palm Beaches. This boat is 1967, 54 feet long, built by the Rogovich family. Uh, it's a real classic. It's like going fishing on a fine piece of furniture. Right now we're about four or five miles out. And we are live bedding with a bonita. Well, there's different techniques to fishing offshore. Trolling is a technique where you can pick up a lot of different pelagic species like sailfish and wahoo, and perhaps out here maybe the, you know, the white or blue marlin. A significant reason for the development of big game fishing in the Palm Beaches is their geographical relationship to the Gulf Stream. The Gulf Stream is a warm current that starts in the Gulf of Mexico, runs north along the east coast of the United States, and just off the coast of Newfoundland turns east and heads for Europe. The waters of the Gulf Stream are considerably warmer than the waters around them, and that attracts the big fish. Also, the stream runs so close to the Florida coast that it's an easy trip for the sport fishing boats. A major breakthrough in the development of the sport was the introduction of boats that were specifically designed and built for big game fishing. During the last years of the 19th century and the early decades of the 20th century, millions of Europeans left their homes and headed to the United States. They were trying to escape poverty, unemployment, and oppression. They passed through Ellis Island and arrived in America. They were told that the streets were paved with gold, and they would soon be wealthy beyond their wildest dreams. Well, when they got there, they found out that the streets were not paved with gold. In fact, they were not paved at all, and they were expected to pave them. In 1900, at the age of 16, John Rybovich Sr., who was always known as Pop, became one of those immigrants. By trade, Pop was a master cabinet maker. His specialty was building spiral staircases of precious wood. Before leaving his town, he helped build the local cathedral. His luggage consisted of the clothes on his back and his skill. Even then, you were only allowed one piece of carry-on. He soon found a place to live and began working for a builder. At the same time that Pop was settling into Chicago, word started going around town that there was a tropical paradise. It was called Florida, and a man named Flagler had built a railroad so the rich and famous could go there for the winters. There were also rumors that workers were needed to build homes. The place they were talking about was Palm Beach and it sounded good to pop. It took him 10 years to pull it off, but in 1910, he arrived in Palm Beach. The area had been a swamp, but since it was considerably smaller than Washington, D.C., they were able to drain it. Soon it was booming with construction. Homes for the rich and a town to support their purchasing power were under construction. Pop didn't speak much English, but his skill level got him work. Unfortunately, the rich and famous did not fully appreciate the noise created by the construction, and so they had a town ordinance passed where there was no construction allowed during the winter months when they were in residence. As a result, Pop Rybovich found himself out of work for six months of every year. 
he realized that he could not survive an entire season without work. An alternative source of income was needed. Since he was surrounded by water, becoming a fisherman seemed like a good idea. Catch fish in the winter, build buildings in the summer. He soon realized that if he was going to succeed in his new venture, he was going to need a partner, somebody who would look after things on land while he was out on the ocean. Ideally, that partner would be a wife. Pop also figured that the best way for him to find a fitting wife with a similar background was to head back north, find temporary work, and a permanent companion. He returned to Florida in 1911 with his new wife, a Czechoslovakian farm girl by the name of Anna Pollock. They rented a small house in West Palm Beach. Pop was a landlubber who knew nothing about the ocean or fishing. Nevertheless, they began their new life in the fishing business. Fishing provided the family with enough money to survive, and Pop used his carpentry skills to keep the house and his boats in good repair. Not long after Pop set up shop, other local fishermen began appreciating his skills at building and maintaining boats. They soon began bringing their own boats to Pop for repairs. He realized that not only was he spending fewer hours each day tending his nets, but he could also make a better living in the boat repair business. He turned his homestead into a small boatyard. Those were the days of prohibition, when alcoholic beverages were illegal. However, a considerable volume of the finest rum and scotch was being transported to Florida by small boats from the Bahamas, where alcohol was legal. This presented Pop with a unique business opportunity. During the day, he worked for the U.S. government, storing the boats that had been confiscated by the feds. At night, Pop and the boys would work in a secret part of the yard, modifying the engines on the boats used by the rum runners to bring in the booze from the Bahamas. The modified engines made the boats so fast that the rum runners could outrun the feds. The Depression years were disastrous for the Rybovich family. Pop needed help if he was going to keep the business going. In the early 1930s, following the Depression, uh, city leaders here in West Palm Beach were really struggling on how to recover um, uh, from this e economic downturn. And so they used the fishing resources as a way to help stimulate the economy and help rebuild the tourism industry. Henry Flagler's railroad didn't hurt either, and that brought them right here. And then we have this tremendous sailfish migration that occurs each winter season here. And that was a really exciting new thing for people from the Northeast to come and experience. At the age of 16, Pop's oldest son, Johnny, came to work for his father. One of his first jobs was to catch bait for the growing number of customers who were taking an interest in fishing as a sport. In 1931, one of their customers paid a yard bill by giving Pop a 26-foot yacht tender. As Johnny worked on the boat, he began rebuilding parts of it to make it better for fishing. One day, Johnny took the boat out and caught his first sailfish. The experience confirmed his belief that a boat could and should be designed specifically for sport fishing. You could say he was hooked. And that was the beginning of the Rybovich family boat building business. Apparently, under certain conditions, conflicting personalities within a family can produce highly functional individuals. Pop had three sons, Johnny, Tommy, and Emil. Pat Rybovich is Tommy's daughter, and she's put together a book about the history of the Rybovich family. It's beautifully illustrated and easy to read, but murder to lift. It weighs 16 and a half pounds. After I read it, I put it to good use in my gym. 
Nice work, Wolf. Pump it up. Good, good. Try again. One more. Big book. Okay. You got it. Ready for the sports fishing. Pat has a very interesting take on her father and her two uncles. So they were three wildly different personalities. Wildly. That, that pretty much nails it. We've got the passionate artist who's obsessed with his work. He works till midnight every night trying to build the perfect boat. He was really obsessed with this dream of, of perfection. And then we had the older brother who was in charge of the business. His job was to make sure that the business made a profit, that the boats were delivered on, on time. And, um, and he was wild about sport fishing. And then there was a third brother, Emil who is Michael's father, and Michael continues the boatyard legacy to this day. So he builds custom sport fishing boats, just like the family has done since 1947. So Michael's father specialized in the electronics and the machines, and the mechanics. So Rybovich boats were the fastest boats, and that mattered back then because they were built for sport fishing, and if you're in a tournament, you want to be out there first. So the three brothers needed each other and oftentimes hated each other. So my dad had no training. He had a high school diploma. That was it. But he was just obsessed with the idea of building a sport fishing boat, which had never been done before. What up until, this was 1947, and my dad was in the war. He was a B-17 bomber pilot. And uh, when he wasn't dropping bombs on Germany, he would sketch, he would come up with sketches of what like his dream boat might look like. And he would send the sketches home to his mother. One of the customers, the yard customers, brought his boat in for renovations. And he saw Tommy's sketches and he said, my dad, Tommy, he said, Tommy, build your dream. So uh, hall number one was his first creation. It was startling. It was so innovative. Nobody had ever seen a, a boat like this. It was a rocket, as I've said, the Emil made it rocket fast. And it was sleek and beautiful. And at the time, all the other boats that were sport fishing were cabin cruisers. The world's first sport fishing boat was built in West Palm Beach in this humble little boat yard with the three brothers. And, and Pop, the father. And uh, yeah, it was launched in 1947. And it's, it's the boat that started it all. And today is a multi-billion dollar sport fishing industry. When I read the history, it became focused on the three sons of Pop. Mm -hmm. But I understand that during the war, there were two daughters that took over the business and ran it. Yep, they were running the business. They worked with Pop hand in hand, and whatever needed to be done, you know, they managed the customers, made sure the repairs were done on time. They, they had a whole business to run, and they also were artists and creators. So they did painting, the, you know, doing the varnish and the bright work and all that. So this was a repair shop, and the girls ran the business. Being that my dad was self-taught, he didn't know how to draw a blueprint. So what he would do is he would carve a model hull. And my dad's got this boom where he, the little model is following. And my dad's watching how it cuts through the water. It's his own version of a wind tunnel. Yeah, yeah. like a wind tunnel, exactly. Today, the Rybovich boats are all over the world. And some boats traveled all the way to Italy just as a cruiser, like Scorpio in Venice. The actor Michael Lerner was a devoted sport fisherman, which makes sense, his father loved fishing. Lerner was nominated for Academy Award as Best Supporting Actor for his role in Barton Fink. But in the Palm Beaches, he was always thought of in connection with his role as a sports fisherman. Another promoter of sports fishing in the Palm Beaches was Kip Farrington. Farrington was a writer who popularized big game fishing in his books and magazine articles. 
From 1937 to 1972, he was the fishing editor of Field and Stream. His largest catch was a 1,135-pound blue marlin. His pal Ernest Hemingway was the first to catch a bluefin tuna, but Kip was the second. As they went after larger and larger game, it became apparent that the fishing tackle in use would not do the job. It was not strong enough to get the fish to the boat before the sharks got to the fish. In 1934, a group of local sportsmen collaborated on the design and construction of a reel that would stand up to the stress of landing a giant marlin or tuna. The result became known as the Knowles Tuna Reel. Ernest Hemingway used it to land the first unmutilated giant bluefin tuna. Whenever Miss Chevy went out, she became the center of attention. Shortly after taking delivery, Charlie Johnson took the boat to fish the Cat K tournament. Again, she was the center of attention, and not just for her unique look, but also for her incredible speed. In excess of 20 knots, that's about 23 miles an hour. Soon after, a second boat was ordered based on the designs of Miss Chevy II. It was ordered by a man named Antonio Joseph Accardo. Mr. Accardo, like many other sports fishermen, was rich and famous. But unlike the other sportsmen, most of whom were involved in traditional American businesses, Mr. Accardo was rich and famous because he was the day-to-day -day boss of Al Capone's Chicago mob. You know, now that I think about it, the mob is almost as much a traditional American business as most others. Shortly after taking delivery of his boat, Mr. Ricardo took it on a fishing expedition during which he caught a giant tuna. The Chicago papers carried photographs of the catch and soon nicknamed Mr. Ricardo the Big Tuna. These days, hole number two is owned by Larry Mullins. What's really interesting about legend is it being hull number two. It's very distinct with a trunk cabin, different than everything else. And people that don't know anything about boats, when they see it underway, they know they're looking at something special. Well, that's part one of Gone Fishing. In this program, we discovered the history of deep sea sport fishing and why the Palm Beaches of Florida became the world epicenter of the sport. We learned why people like Ernest Hemingway and the Long Ranger were attracted to the sport. We visited with a slightly dysfunctional family that invented the sport fishing boat and how those boats have changed over the years. In part two of Gone Fishing, we'll take a look at the nautical phrases that have come into common use, like a cup of joe, and wallop, the importance of catch and release, the women who have become stars of deep sea sport fishing, a boat mechanic who flies his plane around the world to help fix boats, and I will catch a shark. I hope you'll join us. For Travels and Traditions, I'm Bert Wolf. Ah, uh, but wait, there's more. Whenever we edit one of our programs, we always end up with more good material than we can fit in. Interviews, stories, recipes. So we decided to put them on our website, BertWolf.com. <laughs>